Blog Talk Radio. Welcome, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. I do not have to tell you how exciting, interesting, difficult, scary the past week has been. The coronavirus is the biggest thing going, that COVID thing. Is it ever going to end? I'm sure it's going to. Uh, I'm sure we're making progress, and it's a question of time. It may take another year. But whatever, they got to take care of it and get rid of it. I'm sick of staying in. Uh, I'm sick of not doing anything, as you're going to find out during the course of the evening. I even didn't celebrate Christmas Eve with my daughter and her family for fear of picking up the bug of the virus along the way. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Going to open tonight with two topics that I wrote about this week. And uh, one of my in my blogs on different days, they both are very were important to me personally, and I think are important to you, and should have some sort of an impact on you. Will open your eyes in, in many ways. Along the way, getting to these two topics and the rest of the show tonight, we're going to be in Washington D.C., Florida, Maryland, Key West, Rome, Italy, and the Southwest United States. I wrote a blog this week. In fact, I wrote the blog two days ago, the day after Christmas. I titled it, A New Nail in the Cross. A New Nail in the Cross. The cross I'm referring to is the cross Jesus died on. The Atlantic Magazine reported on December 26 about Donald Trump's recent speech before a group of young conservatives. The title of his speech, The Gospel of Donald Trump Jr. I repeat, the gospel of Donald Trump Jr. Uh, he now stands with, well, who is it? Uh, Matthew, Mike, Mike, Matthew, Luke, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, he's number fifth in line now. He is a person who writes the gospel. Of course, he's never spoken to Jesus or saw Jesus in any regard personally, but he believes he has the status to give us the new gospel according to Donald Trump Jr. And if it's according to Donald Trump Jr., I assume his father influence uh, is involved. Trump told the crowd the teachings of Jesus has, and I quote, gotten us nothing. He added, quote, Turning the cheek was holding them back, in effect saying, quote, you want to gain more control and the Bible is getting in the way. Let me repeat those three uh, phrases he said. Gotten us nothing, turning the cheek, you want to gain more control and the Bible is getting in the way. Young Donald's appearance was described as both intensely unappealing and uninteresting. Donald uh, Jr., representative of another situation, he's a representative. Donald Jr. is a representative of another situation where the fruit does not fall far from the tree. Like father, like son. Donald Sr.'s first wife, wife, Ivana, reported several years ago that during their married life, her husband kept a book of Hitler's speeches on the nightstand. The book's titled... The book was titled My New Order. She claimed he read, it, he read from it many evenings before falling to sleep. Trump admitted he had the book. However, he denied ever reading it. The former president gives every impression of being an authoritarian fascist. That's what I look at him as, an authoritarian fascist. It does not surprise me. He may have been a Hitler fan, probably still is. Hitler had trouble with the Catholic and Protestant churches in the 1930s and during World War II. The Night of the Long Knives found many Catholics, including priests, being killed. Dachau was not just a concentration camp for Jews. Dachau was not just a concentration camp for Jews. Catholics were imprisoned there and killed. Dachau, in 1940, had a prisoner population of 2,720. 90% were Polish Catholics, many priests. 1,000 priests died at Dachau. Hitler was not opposed 
to religion because of its basic beliefs. His concern was that an organized religion provided a foundation group already organized that could at some point seek his downfall. Hitler's anti-Semitism had nothing to do with Hitler's concern of Catholics and Protestants. It was a hatred from another source. Hitler claimed, and I quote, Nazism and religion could not coexist in the long run. I repeat, Nazism and religion could not coexist in the long run. Goebbels had an inner dislike for Catholic priests. He added that hatred to those he had for Jews. An interesting historical fact most are unaware of. Hitler and Goebbels were both raised Catholics. Can you believe it? They were both raised Catholics. Protestants outnumbered Catholics in Germany. 40 million Protestants as opposed to 20 million Catholics. The German Protestant church was abused. However, nowhere to the extent the Catholic church was. The Protestants skillfully knew how to play the game from both sides. Modern times are no different as far as the Catholic church and Trump are concerned. Recall, for some two years while Trump was president, Steve Bannon and Newt Gingrich were working to take down Pope Francis. Both had offices in the Vatican, both supporters of the U.S. Conference of Bishops, which opposed Francis and continue to oppose him. Recall also that Trump appointed Gingrich's wife ambassador to the Vatican. The poison spreads. Many drink the Kool-Aid. Trump constantly encourages, openly or subtly, subtly, actions not before accepted as norms. This Christmas cards this year showing family members holding AR-15s and other weapons. The goal in every instance to destroy established values and replace them with authoritarian ones. Wake up, my friends. It could happen. Things are 50-50 at the moment. However, the ploy could move those few inches to make it work. It almost did. January 6. All right. Let's see now. It almost did January 6. All right. Just a second here. My notes are getting screwed up on me. Um, I want to talk now about Social Security. Social Security. Uh, it's it's an, a subject I, I've dwelt on over the years uh, uh, because it's important. Uh, this column, when did I write this one? This column I wrote this morning. It's important. I, I'm repeating the columns, the logs, because these are two very important issues. Uh, the first was the religion thing with Hitler and Trump. He's working to destroy the Catholic Church in this country. No question about it. And Social Security. Uh, I call today's article the Social Security Lie. Eight years ago in 2013, I wrote a column entitled The Theft of Social Security. Five years ago, I retitled the column To the Rape of Social Security. At the same time, updated the column where appropriate and added additional reflections. Today's blog is the third time I update and publish the Social Security blog, this time titled The Social Security Lie. My motivation in rerunning the column a third time. First, I am sick and tired of hearing politicians continuing to cry for the cutting or privatization of Social Security. I am angered by their cries that Social Security is an entitlement, an entitlement, increasing the national debt. They make it sound like the elderly are getting something for nothing. Social Security is not an entitlement. Not one cent of U.S. monies has ever been spent making Social Security payments. Social Security payments come from the paychecks of working people over the course of their lifetimes with an equal contribution by the employer added on. I honestly believe that many of us, I'm smiling as I say this, and you're going to agree with me, it's true. I honestly believe that many of our, our congressional people, elected representatives, do not even know this, what I just told you, that Social Security doesn't tap 
tax dollars, U.S. money. It's money that people have already paid in. It's our own money we're getting back when you get old. I honestly believe they, they're not aware of it, our elected representatives. They are unaware. They believe the garbage the American public has been fed over the years that Social Security is baking, ba- breaking the back of the economy. Second, I am aggravated every time one from a younger generation tells me it is not his or her responsibility to support me in my old age. They are totally unaware of where Social Security payments come from and the theft of Social Security surplus funds, the theft, I repeat, of Social Security surplus funds by the government over the years. Third, Social Security is a very small part of Biden's, you heard me, very, very small part. The Social Security portion concerns itself with the treatment of lump sum Social Security benefits, period. Fourth, and this, this, this is true what I'm going to share with you now. Some idiot congressman made a claim a month ago that Social Security would be broke by 26, 2026. Social Security would be broke by 2026. No way! A false fact. All of which compels, compels me to republish my 2013 and 2016 columns with what I perceive as a strong title also, the social security lie. Now, here's what I said in October 2013, uh, corrected, not corrected, but uh, reworked in, uh, in 2016 and further reworked today. The U.S. government has stolen significant monies from the Social Security Trust Fund. Stolen. Legally, of course. The theft of Social Security is not understood by many. Even elected officials whose business it is to understand a federal program as large as Social Security. Congressional persons have standard talking points which are not true. They erroneously represent to the American public that Social Security cannot support itself, that Social Security is broke, that Social Security benefits must be cut. These congressional persons either know not that of which they speak, or or are intentionally misrepresenting the facts. You will find this column interesting, guaranteed. The United States is in debt to the tune of $31.4 trillion. I can't even conceive of how much money that is. $31.4 trillion. Who is the biggest creditor of the United States? To whom does the United States owe the most money? If you believe Japan or China, you are wrong. The largest creditor of the United States, the entity the U.S. government owes the most money to, is Social Security, specifically its trust fund. $2.9 trillion and going up each day. The second biggest creditor is Japan, the third China. The United States borrows money from Japan and China, sometimes on a daily basis. The United States owes Japan $1.26 trillion. China is close behind at $1.01. Note that they owe Social Security, however, $2.9 trillion. Excuse me. Uh, The United States, recall the numbers I shared with you just now, owes Social Security more than twice what it owes Japan and China individually, and more than its combined debt obligation to Japan and China. Surprising? Shocking. Social Security is not broken. It has worked well for 81 years. The United States government is broken. Government has been grabbing money from Social Security for years, has never paid a cent back, and from what I can determine, has no plan to pay any money back. It has been made to appear that Social Security is a noose around the neck of the United States economy. The people have been told that Social Security benefits must be cut so the economy may survive. Bunk, pure, unadulterated bunk. Examine the pertinent facts. These are the eye-openers, my friends. Social Security comes out of every American paycheck. 
an employer contribution added to it. The government pays not one penny of the money deposited in the Social Security Trust Fund. The amount a person pays into the trust fund over the course of a working lifetime is substantially more than the benefit derived. A worker pays into the fund generally for 40 to 50 years. The monthly Social Security check received by the senior citizens is peanuts in comparison. Except for 11 years, Social Security has in every year of its existence, 81 years, note, taken in more than it has paid out. There is always a surplus. Since 1984, Social Security has taken in more each year than it has paid out. The money Social Security pays out include old age retirement benefits, that's the monthly check we get, temporary assistance for needy families, Medicare, Medicaid, SHIP, and SSI, all out of the trust fund. A surplus left over each year besides. Amazing. A terrific program Franklin Roosevelt put in place. One problem exists. There should be a hell of a balance in the Social Security Trust Fund. I smile as I share this with you. There should be a hell of a balance. Revenues annually are generally more than what is expended. There is no money in the trust fund, however. The government has taken it all, continues to do so, and never pays a cent back. The genius for the legal looting of Social Security had its beginnings minimally with President Lyndon Johnson. President Ronald Reagan and his financial advisor, Alan Greenspan, jumped in with both feet, as did President William Clinton and House Speaker Newt Gingrich. Bush, too, made no contribution to the formulation of the plan. He simply took advantage of a program already in place. By so doing, he financed significant tax cuts for the rich, paid for the Iraqi war, and funded the 2008 bank bailouts. The plunder of the Social Security Surplus Fund has been legalized. The procedure is simple. The United States government was allowed to borrow, and I put that in quotes, the surplus monies. In return, the United States would give the trust fund what were termed, and I quote again, special service non-marketable U.S. government bonds. That's heavy stuff, special service non-marketable U.S. government bonds. You can wipe your ass with them, as I'm going to show you in a moment. What are these bonds? Nothing. Non-marketable. They cannot be used as collateral for a bank loan. No sane person would buy them. The bonds, nothing more than IOUs. Respectfully stated, good for use as outhouse toilet paper. A scam. It was thought that if and when things turned adverse for Social Security, the government would redeem these bonds. In effect, pay back Social Security. After all, the commitment of the United States and Congress is to meet the country's obligations. The government's ability to pay depends on its power to tax and diagonal or borrow. Congress reflects neither past nor present desire to pay. The government refrains from even discussing these IOUs and their payment. Now, where did all this surplus money go? How did certain presidents and Congress spend the money in four areas? First, to make up for the reduced taxes on the rich. Isn't that wonderful? (laughs) We didn't get any of it. To make up for the reduced taxes on the rich. Thank you, Bush II and Trump. Second, two unpaid wars. Thank you, Bush II, Obama, Trump, and to a minimal extent, Biden. Third, the 2008 bailout of the banks. Thank you, Bush II and Obama. Finally, other government programs that needed to be funded for which there might not be sufficient funding without invading the Social Security Trust Fund. The process, again, simple. Surplus trust funds, extra money every day, are borrowed by the United States. In most instances, by the way, on a daily basis, they don't screw around the government. An IOU is given to purportedly secure repayment. The money goes into the nation's general fund to help pay for tax cuts, wars, and similar things. 
Certain economic experts have suggested a simple 30-year program to repay the IOUs would correct the problem and pay off the $2.9 trillion still growing debt. The real problem is no one cares about paying back. No one cares about paying back. It is the old story of borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, except Peter never gets paid back. The government takes Social Security surpluses and spends them like a bunch of college kids out on a night on the town. Social Security and Medicare should not be touched in any fashion other than to perhaps increase benefits. Do you, let me, do you appreciate or realize what I'm going to share with you now? If the government wasn't grabbing this money since 1986 or 84, whatever it was, all right, taking it all, your Social Security check could be at least twice as much as you're getting now, probably more. You heard me? You'd have twice the money coming in every month. Wouldn't that be nice? But but no, because <laughs> the government doesn't want to do that. They've already taken the money. They don't want to pay it back. Because if they pay it back, they've got to get money from someplace else to take care of the rich and screw the poor. That's basically the way I, I see it, the, the only way to see it, okay? Uh it would be nice that we could get twice as much money back at least. Do the paperwork. You'll see how it works. Another plan would be for the government to stop immediately removing any funds from the trust fund. The surpluses would build, but would build up rapidly. If they stopped taking money within a year or two, we'd have, oh, how much money in that trust fund. And at some point, they could start increasing those checks we receive on a monthly basis. Again, it's our money. The sad, this sad scenario makes me wonder, makes anybody wonder, whether the government even cares about the 99%. It appears to me that all our elected officials are concerned with are their images and their friends, not for anything or anyone else. Make the rich richer and the poor poorer. In my opinion, it seems to be working. And that's it for Social Security. I hope it aggravates the hell out of you. Now, I'm going to talk about COVID here. Uh, I've got several different items to share with you regarding COVID. You know all of them or most of them. You probably have my thoughts also. So let me start here. Uh, we're in a surge across the country. I mean, I think they have more people in the hospital today than they did uh, in January or the first January of the problem. Uh, it, it's horrible. <laughs> I'm laughing. I'm not laughing. This is sad. I don't leave the house. <laughs> I wear my mask half the day in the house also. Uh, it's, it's, I'm worried. It's crazy. The whole thing's crazy, but you've got to protect yourself, especially if you're 86 years old. Now, Florida, we have a great governor here, DeSantis. He's the worst thing. He's worse than Donald Trump. I've got to say, no, I didn't think anybody could ever, anyone could be worse than Donald Trump. DeSantis is, and they, if Trump doesn't run, they think he will be the Republican candidate for president because he's never acknowledged there is such a thing as coronavirus, COVID-19. However, it seems he got his shots. And recently he was interviewed on a TV show and asked if he got the booster shot. He weaseled around and didn't answer the question. The interviewer hit him again. Tell us, come on, you didn't answer the question. Did you get a booster shot? And he weaseled again and did not respond to the question. Now, the numbers are going up in every state. I forget what the numbers were today. This day alone, this day alone, see, today, Tuesday, uh, I don't have the specific number, I can't recall it, but it was something like there are 250,000 new cases today alone in the United States. Some number in that area, 250,000 new coronavirus cases today in the United States. Let me talk about Florida. Uh, now, over the Christmas weekend, and the Christmas weekend would be Saturday and Sunday, according to this report, 39,000 new cases were reported in Florida over the Christmas weekend. 39,000 new cases, two days, were reported. On Christmas Day, 21,040. On Sunday, 17,955. Uh, 
ridiculous, terrible, horrible. Even down here, we're getting killed in Key West. Everybody's, the numbers keep going up. I honestly believe they're going to correct this thing. It's not wishful thinking. It may take a whole year. It may take six months. Uh, the best people in the world are working on curing this virus. Uh, and it'll get done. It'll get done. But a lot of people are going to die between, get sick and die between now and then. I hope none of us are some of those people. Maryland is an example of the hospitals being overloaded. Two Maryland uh, health care centers uh, have declared their hospitals as, and I quote, disasters, okay, disasters because of rising uh, COVID cases. The hospitals are the University of Maryland Upper Chesapeake Health, University of Maryland, Upper Chesapeake Health, and Hartford Memorial Hospital. Coronavirus cases in these two hospitals in the month of December alone have so far risen 458%. Hospitalizations, 458%. They don't have enough beds. They don't have enough medical staff. An official at one of the hospitals said, and I quote, the demand for our services has outstripped our resources, which includes staffing. He said, and I quote, we are at the burnout stage and we are at the moral distress stage for our staff members. All right. Another administrator said, and this is the important thing, and I quote, between 75 to 80 percent of the patients admitted to the hospitals because of COVID-19 uh, have been unvaccinated. People, the people going to the hospital now in the huge numbers are the unvaccinated. The people that are generally infecting the rest of the population are the unvaccinated. Okay? Uh, they're smart. You know, they're strong minded people. I can do what I want. This is a freedom. I don't have to have this imposed on me. Well, some of them are going to die, and when they want to get the shot, it's going to be too late. Uh, well, Dr. M MSNBC has a Dr. Gupta. He's been on the show for about two years now. I watch MSNBC every day. And he's a young guy, smart, smart. He always comes up with a straight answer, no screwing around. And here's what he had to say uh, about the, helping to correct this problem in a certain fashion. He has called for the hospitals to deny medical assistance and care to anyone who remains unvaccinated against COVID. Gupta said, and I quote, any unvaccinated person uh, needing, requiring medical attention should be last in line. He also said, and I quote, how do we rank, order that priority? We do it for organs, kidneys, livers, lungs. We say, did you smoke? Did you drink recently? If you did, you're lower on the list, even to the bottom of the list, okay? We, we need to do and to start thinking about that model for who we care for, who gets sick with the virus. Uh, well, let's see. I've, I've only got two minutes here. But, you know, the thing that nobody, nothing's changed in two years with coronavirus. We have to do the same things today. We're being told to do the same things they were told to do two years ago. Get your shots. Get vaccinated. Get your booster shot now. Uh, wear a mask. <laughs> and don't go where there are a lot of people. Avoid large gatherings. Simple. It's been the same thing for two years. People don't understand. About 40% of our population does not understand. Uh, my time is up. I've got more on coronavirus. I had so many other things to talk about, but there's no time. Uh, so that's it for tonight, folks. I, I wish each of you a happy and prosperous New Year. Things will get better. They have to get better, but they could get worse. But let's hope everything gets better, and I hope everything gets better for you. And other than that, good night.